Good morning and welcome to Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church. It's hard to believe it's November. Don't look around at the clock on the wall because it says 12 o'clock. We'll, we'll get those changed later. And was anybody here at 9.30? Just in case. We're, good. we're doing pretty good these days, aren't we? So Today we're moving on to a new theme in our journey through the Old Testament. We're going to th be thinking together about conquest. And that's a powerful theme. So we'll unpack a little bit of all that in just a minute. But it's good to be together in the house of the Lord. We're grateful that you are here with us today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our God, we thank you for the victories of the past that mean so much to us. And help us to look carefully at those victories, because we know with every victory comes responsibility. Just as with every loss, comes your grace and your healing. We realize that all of life, both in the biblical narratives and in the narrative of our life together, includes highs and lows and ups and downs. So let us experience your goodness and rely upon your guidance in every twist and turn of life. Help us to know that you are with us through all. On this day that we observe All Saints Sunday, we thank, we're thankful for those of our past who are still with us, who are still watching over us, and we appreciate so much their influence and blessing. On this week that we give thanks for veterans, we are grateful for those who went the extra mile to serve in ways that were often difficult sometimes lonely, sometimes discouraging, sometimes leading to great sacrifice. For those sacrifices and service, we give you thanks. So now guide us as we seek to worship together, and may we be blessed as we gather for worship and for conferencing today. In your name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to begin with our affirmation of faith, so I'd like to invite you to stand before we do our songs and join with me as we say together what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together, beginning with a great song of conquest, Onward Christian Soldiers.
and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is good to be together in the house of God today. Thank you so much for your presence today, and I hope you feel the same thing I do when your time of week comes around to Sunday morning, that this kind of helps tether you and anchor you and help remind you that there's a rhythm to life and a rhythm even to the confusion that we so often experience. I don't know about you, but I need that anchor. And even as our worship and scripture sometimes push us, sometimes kind of poke us in ways we don't want to hear, it also gives us something to hold on to, and I pray that you're able to experience that. Special word of welcome to those who worship with us online as well. Thank you for being here. We'd love to see you in person, but we're glad to see you in this way as well, and we pray that this worship time will be a blessing to you. We want to remind each of you to register your attendance using the Connect cards, and then also use those for your prayer cards today. Those of you at home, if you'll leave a note of encouragement or prayer requests, whatever, we would love to hear from you as well, too. We'd remind you that today is a special day and that we're having church conference following our worship time together. As soon as we dismiss worship, we'll just gather back down um, for that time of conferencing and some important business. And then we're so blessed to have uh, pizza time downstairs. If I think the kitchen is raring to go. Is that right? Awesome. Awesome. Well, that always gets my attention. So we hope, even if you didn't plan on it, I suspect there will be enough pizza. And I'll go last so you can have my piece and I'll, I'll make do with something else. I think there will be plenty to go around. Thank you for your presence today. So we um, have been working through an amazing journey. Themes 
in Genesis and Exodus for several weeks now. Have you noticed that these themes in these first two books of the Bible go from high to low, to high to low? Genesis and Exodus are a little bit like a roller coaster. I heard of that roller coaster image up to apply to the book of Judges as well. And we did Judges some time ago where we talked about the times that people would flounder without a leader. And then God would provide a leader and they'd come back together. And then they'd flounder again. Well, it's not just the book of Judges. It's life. It's life, isn't it? Have you seen roller coasters in your life? Is there anybody here that's either been a totally steady journey in your life with no ups or downs or a totally uphill journey where it just gets better and better with no bumps along the way? If so, please see me after church. I'd love to know what your secret is. We know that, you know, whether they're kind of the smooth ups and downs of a little child's roller coaster or more like the wild, crazy ups and downs of one of those rides at Bush Gardens where nowadays they actually have roller coasters that go and they go and then you look ahead and the track disappears. Ever been on one of those? I remember that from Disney's Animal Kingdom. The track just stops and you sort of hope that your car is going to stop too. And it does but then you know what it does. It takes you back down backwards, and you go through that loop backwards. Life is like that sometimes. We've been seeing the highs and the lows of Genesis and Exodus. Well, it certainly began with a high. Creation is a high, is it not? And we were reminded that it's all about beauty, and it's all about goodness. We learned a new song a couple of months ago, and we'll need to sing it again soon just to remind us. I will sing of the goodness of God. We just, we just need to hold on to that. And our response to the beauty and goodness of creation is simply awe and delight. We sing songs like, this is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. As we were working our way through the stories of creation, we went back to that song that's many people's favorites, and I don't have it on the slides today, but some of you can probably remember it. Don't open the book, just share some of these words from memory if you can. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. We should probably circle back. Through Genesis 1 and 2 every now and then, just to remember how good and great God is. But you know what happened after Genesis 1 and 2? Genesis 3. And things kind of went south rather quickly. The high of creation was quickly followed by a low, and in this series we call it crisis. Instead of being in harmony with God, which is really represented by that beautiful garden. Our author called it the great dance, where we're just in love with God. Crisis comes. And we saw three things in particular to represent crisis. We saw Adam and Eve crossing boundaries. There was so much that was available to them, and here was a boundary. Here was a no. And just like a little five-year-old, they had to tiptoe over and explore that no, that was, which was off limits, was so tantalizing and tempting. They just had to go there, and they paid the price. 
And then the story of Adam and Eve's two sons. So quickly we turn to brother against brother. Jealousy. And Cain slays Abel. And then we have the story of the, the general evil that, that happened around the world that caused God to decide to send a great flood. We're not one-fourth of the way through the book of Genesis. And we have all this. Creation is followed by crisis. But the roller coaster continues. And the low of crisis, you can't get any lower than a great flood, can you? Was followed by another high. The high of calling. God called men and women like Noah, like Abraham and Sarah, like Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel, and eventually Joseph. And time and again throughout the book of Genesis, we saw God raising people up. Now those had their ups and downs too. Think about Joseph in particular. Talk about some roller coaster. A roller coaster that would land him in a pit when his brothers betrayed him. A roller coaster that would lead him in chains in Egypt when he was falsely accused. But God always delivered. God always came through. And Joseph wound up in a place of tremendous influence and blessing. Joseph somehow broke the revenge cycle. He had every reason to take it out on others. But he did it differently. But that led to another low. What's the next C? Creation. Crisis, calling, oh yeah, captivity, captivity. The people were in a great position in Egypt, but then they became in a bad position. Joseph had long passed away, memories faded, and the Hebrews were now viewed as a threat, and so they were enslaved in Egypt, and they cried out for deliverance. But that led to another calling, the calling of Moses, and the people were soon bound for the promised land. That's the song we sang last week. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. Of course, once they crossed that Red Sea, that wilderness had its own highs and lows too, didn't it? It was not nearly as simple as they anticipated it might be. But eventually, they would arrive and prepare to enter that promised land. And that led to the sea for today. Conquest. The time of conquest had come at last. Promised land would soon be not just a promise, it would be reality. It had taken so much longer than anticipated. A whole generation had passed from the scene. They had passed the baton to the next generation. It was one generation that crossed the Red Sea to get out of Egypt. It would be another generation that would cross the Jordan, Jordan's stormy banks, to enter the Promised Land. One thing we have seen, and I hope you've paid attention to, I hope I've explained it well enough, is that, is that this is not just about what happened to them. It is what happens to us as well. Don't just read about creation and crisis and calling and captivity and conquest and say, wow, now I know more about what God did thousands of years ago. Read these stories and have your mind open to say, oh, I've been through moments of beauty and goodness, but I've been through moments of ugliness and rebellion as well. I've had my moments of crisis. I've had my moments of calling. I've had my moments of captivity. That's why these epic stories of Genesis give light to understanding not just them, but understanding us. We too have our own roller coasters. We too swing between the high of the beauty and goodness of God to the low of struggle and rebellion and sin and captivity. We're always looking to perceive the goodness of God amid the ugliness of a broken world. That's why coming to church is a little bit like an eye exam. An eye exam every week, okay, we've seen a lot. 
Well, let's get our glasses fixed. Let's, let's get our perspective right. Let's put on God's spectacles to help us see things aright. And the Word of God really does help us see and understand things differently than if we did it on our own. Well, that brings us to today's scripture. The people are about to enter across those Jordan stormy banks, and they get some instructions. And we read these from Deuteronomy chapter 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For that would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But this is how you must deal with them. Break down their altars. Smash their pillars. Hew down their sacred poles and burn their idols with fire. Verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people, his treasured possession. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. From the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and who repays in their own person those who reject him. He does not delay, but repays in their own person those who reject him. Verse 11. Therefore, observe diligently the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that I am commanding you today. We give thanks to God for the gift of his word. Now, one would think that this next stage conquest would simply be another high. We've gotten through the struggles of captivity. We've gotten through the struggles of traveling through the wilderness we finally reached the promised land, and we're just ready to sing, Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. But instead, conquest becomes something of a mixed bag. There's joy and victory. But there's something that doesn't seem quite right. If you think kind of hard about that, and sometimes it's easier if you don't think hard about it. But if you think hard about that, you stop and think, now wait a minute. There were little kids living in Canaan's fair and happy land before the people of Israel marched in and said, we're ready to come back and grab this land as our own. Away with you. Get out. God is through with you and God has prepared a place for me. When you read those Bible stories, do you, do you just say, yay, we won? Or does a part of you say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. There was once a Bible study and they were going through all these Old Testament stories and they found story after story of brutality and revenge. And somebody said, I just don't understand why everything's happening this way. And one of the persons said, well, I think that's before God became a Christian. Um, as those of us who are people of the New Testament, we have to be real careful here because we honor our Jewish brothers and sisters and realize they struggled with these stories too. For generations and generations, they have struggled with the mystery of how you put together a God of love and grace who works in amazing ways, who loves all his children, 
who would also turn around and say, you know, people of Israel, you're going to be judged on how you treat the outsider. Because you were once an outsider. So you're going to be judged on how you treat an outsider. We have a lot of things to hold together as we try to make sense of the whole Bible story. If you read that chapter in our study book, you were challenged as you began to maybe rethink some things and say, wow, never quite thought about it that way. Now this word comes that you're not only to come into this promised land, but you're to sweep everybody else out. Get out of here. It's my turn now because God's on my side. Our study chapter for this week also mentioned a psalm, Psalm 137. A beloved psalm, a very eloquent psalm of captivity. It's very ironic because it's written after the fall of Jerusalem. Many years after what we're talking about, when Jerusalem would be taken away from them. You know, God's people came in and said, this land is ours now, you get out. Then it turned around and happened to them too. Babylon came in and said, okay, this land is ours now, you get out. And many of them were taken off into exile. And that psalm represents actually the inability to sing because we're told that the Babylon captors would look at them and say, sing us some of your songs. Sing us some of your songs for entertainment. And God's people would say, how can we sing in a foreign land? All their hopes were about that promised land and now they've lost it. They were having a hard time hoping again. But it's kind of ironic because this became a song. This became a song. It was a song about how I can't sing a song. And that psalm has become precious to people across the years because in the psalms we see everything. We see the psalms of just happiness and praise and, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all of the earth. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then psalms like this, how can I sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? May I never forget you, O oh God. Such a deep truth. Because indeed they're singing and praying to the Lord, even when they're having a hard time finding the words. This psalm remains a great encouragement to people who are on the down of the roller coaster, whether as a whole culture, whole people, or a family, or an individual. Going through great loss and grief and saying, my song just doesn't, Come. I put something on Facebook this week that kind of popped up because I had shared it years ago. It was about someone who um, would meet with people going through severe depression and would say, um, if you've been to, if you're a churchgoer, I want to know, um, are you singing the songs at church or are you just sitting there? And people going through severe depression would nearly always say, well, no, I'm not singing. You know, and he told them, well, in addition to everything else we're doing, counseling, maybe medication, maybe therapy, for the next four weeks, I want you to go and sing every word of every song at church. Because you can't keep singing those songs without something happening in your heart. We need the songs of faith, not up just at the top of the roller coaster, but maybe even more at the bottom of the roller coaster. I actually love it that not all the psalms are happy and joyful. There are songs of intense praise and joy, and there are psalms of great abandonment. But have you ever seen the ending of Psalm 137? I went back and checked the hymnal that I grew up with that was published in the 1960s, the Old Methodist Hymnal. And it had a bunch of responsive readings in there, and a lot of them came from the Psalms. And it had the beautiful words of Psalm 137, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? But then it stopped. It didn't have all the verses. Because if you read all the verses, you get a little further and you read this, Psalm 137, beginning with verse 8. O Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy is the one who pays you back for what you have done for us. Happy is the one who takes your babies and smashes them against the rocks. Did you know that was in the Bible? Is that one of your favorite verses? 
Or does it kind of leave you with a lump in your throat? No wonder the 1964 Methodist hymnal said, we're just going to cut that thing off. We'll just do the first six verses and that'll be plenty. I don't ever remember <coughs> studying this verse in children's Sunday school. In adult Sunday school, for that matter. We kind of sweep it away. But if we're going to be grown-ups and dealing with the Bible, there's a time we need to come and look real carefully and say, wait a minute, we need the whole story. And when the 1990s came along and they published a new edition of the United Methodist Hymnal, for some reason they said, okay, the whole psalm is going in there. We're not going to leave that out. Does, is, that, is that in there because God wants us to track down our enemies and confiscate their babies and um, kill them in front of our enemies' eyes so that they can be not only lose their life but go through the even greater devastation of seeing their baby's life taken from them? Is that in the Bible because of that? Some people would say, well, maybe so. You know, a righteous cause means somebody is going down. But we try to juggle all that together with Jesus who came and said, you've heard your whole life hate your enemies, but I've got something different to tell you. I say, remember what he said? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. When somebody slaps you on the cheek, slug them back. Wait, no, that's not it. When somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. And that's not because Christians have it right and Jewish folks have it wrong. That's because, you see, it's not that God became a Christian. It was that in Jesus we see the fullness of God. Why is there so much revenge in the Bible? Maybe because God loves revenge. Or maybe because God understands us. And just as we struggle to understand what it means to be godly in a messed up world, these stories remind us that the people of the past struggled with what it means to be godly in a messed up world. As we think about conquest, as we think about desires for revenge, there's an important lesson. That there can be an ugly side to this notion that God is with me. I can say God is with me. That's one thing. To say, God is with me, God is with us, but it so easily slips from beauty to ugliness. God is with me, and God is not with you. We draw lines that God never drew. And we see it happen time and time again. Just to do a quick journey through history, think about the Crusades, when in the name of Jesus, people went to war. It said, we want that land back. That land has been tossed and turned so many times. God bless that land. But wow, the things committed people do to take back a land. In our lifetime, we've been challenged to rethink Christopher Columbus, haven't we? Many of us grew up learning, oh, he was the great hero who brought good things to the new world. And later we read the fine print. Oh, good things like syphilis and some other things. Enjoy. We rethink the way native tribes were treated in the settlement of what we now call North America. We think about the slave trade in North America. And in all of those examples, Crusades, Columbus, Native tribes, slave trade. Who was doing most of that? 
baptized Christians who believe God was calling them to do it. Let's not pretend. Let's not pretend. One of the most powerful statements against ugliness that I've ever seen took place after 9-11. It's the words of President George W. Bush, Bush 43, who spoke so eloquently about some of the ugliness that emerged, not in them, but in us, after 9-11. Here's a portion of what he said. The face of terrorism is not the true faith of Islam. That's not what Islam is all about. America counts millions of Muslims amongst our citizens, and they make an incredibly valuable contribution to our country. They are doctors, lawyers, law professors, members of the military, entrepreneurs, shopkeepers, moms and dads, and they needed to be treated with respect. In our anger and emotion, our fellow Americans must treat each other with respect. And I'll never forget those words because that could have been a time when President Bush could have stirred the pot. You remember, many of you, what that was like. He could have stirred it up. He could have tossed a little more gasoline on the fire. And probably many of us would have said, rah, 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 go George. But instead of tossing gasoline, he helped calm the fire. And in every chapter of our life together, we need people who will step up with words of healing and hope, not words of stirring the pot. The title of our study book, chapter 11, was From Ugliness, a Beauty Emerges. You know, every time we come to the Lord's table, it may be the moment that we most are reminded that it's not about us. That this table is greater than just us. That we are guests. That the hand of Jesus is offered to us and we really don't have much to offer back to him. We simply receive his amazing grace. Today is also All Saints Sunday and it's a appropriate to do communion on All Saints Sunday because I, I happen to believe the time that we are closest to the saints, those who've gone before us, is when we come to the Lord's table. We call it the communion of saints. They are with us. I was listening to All Saints music in the car as I came over, and I heard the words of a song I've heard, heard many times, For All the Saints. And there was a little line in the song that almost brought a tear to my eye as I heard it being sung by the choir on the radio. We feebly struggle. They in glory shine. It's talking about we who are still on earth. We feebly struggle. They, those who have gone before us, in glory shine. And we believe that. We sing that, we're reminded of that, but we sometimes forget that, don't we? We sometimes forget that. The incredible presence of those who still watch over us. We're the ones with the struggle. Their struggle's gone. They are cheering us on. The Bible says we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. What a blessing to give thanks to God for our lives that are precious to us in our continued journey.
worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That is who you are. My God, that is who you are. You wipe away all tears. You mend the broken heart. You're the answer to it all. Jesus, you wipe away all tears. You mend the broken heart. You're the answer to it all, to it all. Touching every life, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, meeting every need, I worship you, I worship you. Wanted the former president to be the same way.